We're delighted to say Nicola Talent, the Sunday World Investigations Editor and host of the Crime World podcast, is with us. Nicola, good morning to you again. How are you? Good, mor good morning. I'm just looking at the front pages there myself. The Codfather is... Uh has been used a few times still nonetheless a good headline hey always always play the hits isn't that the so better yeah yeah so better there's rules um Absolutely. look there's, there's lots to get into and we, we talked a little bit about the statement earlier on can i ask you just from a kind of macro perspective what's the point of issuing a statement to talk sport if you're daniel kinnan what's the audience for that who's 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 he attempting to talk to in that i can't kind of work that bit out it's hard to work quite a lot of it out, to be honest with you, because you're trying to apply your own logic to somebody who's behaving illogically. Um, talk sport. Look, I imagine that Daniel Kinahan was only going to release that statement to a broadcaster we're going, who were going to agree to run it in full, uninterrupted, unchallenged, and allow it flow from start to finish, which I do think a lot of broadcasters would not have agreed to they would have maybe you know suggested that they would of course have a, a statement but be able to challenge it i mean they that that seemed to be it seemed to be on his uh you know rules i think that that went yesterday now they did have a journalist on in the aftermath who who commented on it but it was a very lengthy statement to run from start to finish and from somebody who is suspected of such its crimes, uh, it's quite extraordinary, really. It, 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 like, the audience is in Ireland, right? Because everybody in Ireland is relatively familiar with the story, you would think, maybe notwithstanding Paul Mescal training in that gym in Australia. Is the audience, the U is it a UK audience? Uh, and the yeah, talk sport, talk sport is definitely a UK audience. And as far as I know, um, they do have a big audience in Spain, in the expat community, I think they nearly have, and I could be wrong here, but I think they have a studio out in Spain. So that audience is, and it's obviously for sports fans. Um, so that's, you know, that's really what he's trying to, to hit. He doesn't really care about the audience. He doesn't want to come on a show that might challenge uh, the allegations of criminality around him. He just wants to basically say to sports, I'm here and I'm here to stay to the boxing world, you know, just because these pesky shows like Panorama on the BBC and, and the Irish media say these things about me, I ain't going anywhere and I'm still in the background arranging these fights. I mean, that to me yesterday was the one thing that could cause problems uh, and was probably ill-advised on his behalf. He's really put the ball into the court of Sky Sports and BT Sports there by suggesting that, or saying outright, that he's still very much involved in organising those big events. Yeah, because that, that, that does kind of ramp up the pressure on the, the sports broadcasters. This seems like it's a, there's kind of a pattern where um, there's a, a PR surge and then there's a bunch of boxers come out uh, and back Daniel Kinahan and talk about their personal experience with him. So yesterday, Amir Khan, very, very famous boxer over the last two decades and involved in, in boxing regulation, came out and said he was the nicest man he'd ever met. Um, it does seem as if this yeah. is the important, that, that's the court of public opinion that Daniel Kinahan is courting with these pronouncements. And, and it's like uh, shoring up your base, essentially, in political terms. Yes, and, you know, if you look at it, a lot of the boxers that support him have these very personal stories that are linked to him. Um, you know, Tyson Fury, Ben Davison has come out and said where he was when Daniel Kinahan plucked him from the scrap heap and uh, funded him to greatness, there's no doubt. I mean, he's made an incredible comeback. You've Peter McDonough there, who speaks about Daniel Kinahan saving his life. Um, they have very personal experiences with him, a lot of these boxers, even though he's not part of MTK, we're told, where they have been signed to. Um, it's an absolute pattern. And from the beginning, from the setup, the establishment of that then MGM gym in, in Marbella, where it all started, um, and I recall when we went out there um, to Spain, we were actually covering a story on the Kinahan uh, organization and discovered that gym 
myself and a colleague had gone out and I just remember looking into the into it, it's down a kind of a hill down into a kind of basement car park thing and wondering was this a hobby or was there something more to it? What 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 exactly was it? We didn't quite understand what it was. Daniel Kinahan was dealing with the builders and there was lots of talk about it. There was pages in the society pages in Marbella about the opening of it. And as we kind of continue, continued to monitor it, what I did notice was from the very early days, MGM, which is now MTK, courted celebrity, which is a well-worn uh, sort of business model to success, you know? I mean, it's why all these businesses send their products to, you know, uh, Instagrammers and TikTokers and this sort of thing. But yeah, it was a stream of celebrities would have gone into uh, the gym I don't think most of them knew what was going on. Um, they'd go in, they'd be photographed in it, similar to exactly what happened to the actor there yesterday, Paul Meskell. Um, so there's this sort of element of court and celebrity, and that brings you credibility. And actually, if you go way back to Sammy the Bull Gravano's testimony to the US Senate, when he was quizzed about, he was a big mafiosa who, who who gave evidence against John Gotti and others. Um, and he was questioned about the Mafia's links to boxing many years ago, in the early 90s. And he discussed how they had gone into it to do exactly that. So if, if, if there was any questions asked, that there would be, you know, big celebrities, if they had to go to court, that big celebrities would attend, would give them character references, that they would be friends with these people. He even spoke about how, uh, you know, the mafia talked about getting close to Donald Trump at the time um, I, I, and others who, who owned hotels. So it's a well-worn um, thing. Some of them are, the boxers haven't educated themselves about the background of Daniel Kinahan. Others don't care because the money is 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 coming in and uh they feel they have to back him no matter what I, that was interesting i i didn't, I didn't know about the the Gotti, uh johnny the bull mm. what was the surname sammy the bull gravano and actually the um for anybody interested those senate hearings are online they're on youtube and you can see him give his testimony to the u.s senate they had become concerned about uh links between the mafia and boxing at the time he actually talks about how they had targeted a sort of down on his look boxer, the mafia, and that they had brought him in to uh, and backed him to fight. Now, in those cases, they were either backing them to lose or backing them to win. So there was betting symbols on the background as well. But uh, it is very interesting. It's it's interesting to look at it and to compare maybe what's going on now. Well, I think that is kind of one of the key things here, actually, that it, the lessons of history are fertile ground for us to to kind of learn about what's happening in all aspects of society if you think about it but it, the the because the one of the defenses that people put up is like well should the mafia have always been involved in boxing what's the big deal but the reason why the mafia got involved in boxing wasn't just because they liked the fights and they liked the fighters it was because it was unbelievably useful it's a, a lawless largely unregulated society uh, you're dealing with massive sums of money that you can amass in quite a short period of time you can fix the results if you need to and uh, there's all sorts of other reasons why um, the historically the Italian Mafia in New York and uh, all the way back to Murder Inc would have been getting involved in in boxing at that point it's it's the perfect um, well, business most sport. definitely I mean they got involved in construction in New York as well but all to launder money I mean, they were laundering money through it. Gravano talks about, I actually wrote about this in a, in a booklet I, I did for the Sunday World a couple of months ago, maybe it was last year now, Off the Ropes. Um, and he also spoke about how they would get into gyms. He, was, he went down to Brooklyn to look at this particular gym uh, to buy it. And the plan was they were going to buy the gym and they'd be able to launder a lot of funds through coaches, merchandise, and all the other things that go with it. So, um, yeah, it's certainly anybody who, who's a bit train spotter about all this <laughs> might find his uh, videos interesting. Right, we'll definitely try and dig them out. Uh, Nicola, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, the, the, the other kind of aspect of this where uh, Kinahan keeps talking about not being 
convicted and there have been no convictions. In a way, was Daniel Kinahan being in the United Arab Emirates, did it kind of suit the, the, the legal authorities uh, a little bit because it was out of sight, out of mind? Is, the, is this boxing actually uh, refocusing attention in Ireland on that criminal investigation? Had, had that trail gone cold in any way? Is, is there also an element of this that might backfire on that level? No, the trail hasn't gone cold at all. I mean, the plan here in Ireland and the the criminal the, sorry, the plan rather to take down the criminal organisation that is the Kinahan Organised Crime Group has gone ahead as planned from the beginning. It was a five year plan. Obviously, the situation in the last year with COVID has delayed plenty of things across the world. Uh, but fact of the matter is that plan is is ongoing and there is no question that there's anyone being forgotten. In actual fact, I would say that you're into the final uh, takedown, which would be the, the, the management structure there really, you know, so there's no question. This boxing thing has always gone on as a different trajectory. Um, it's nothing to do with policing. I find it quite amazing that uh, a lot of the the boxing was it the television companies are Eddie Hearn and that are saying, oh, this you know this is nothing to do with us. It's to do with guards or it's to do, with, uh, you know, the UK police. Like the fact of the matter is, MTK's headquarters are in the United Arab Emirates. Around 2016, when the Spanish police moved in to arrest a guy called James Quinn, who was subsequently convicted of the murder of of J Gary Hutch. They also raided MGM Jim in Marbella at that point, but just shortly before that, that was September of 2016, um, MGM had restructured financially and they had um, moved what they call their intellectual rights out to the United Arab Emirates. Uh, I was trying to follow it as much as I could, but the trail ran dry there because they moved it to a place called Ras Al Kamai, which is a free trade zone, and there's no company records, you can't get at anything there. So um, that is a business that's operating. Obviously, MTK have no gyms here in Ireland, and they aren't operating here in Ireland. So as a result, there's no way the Irish authorities can go after. I mean, the Irish authorities and certainly the Gardaí cannot sort of troop into the Emirates and start investigating the finances of a company that's in existence there. So it's all a bit naive or else it's, it's uh, you know, for them to say, oh, the guards should be investigating this. It's just, it's just very uneducated at, at the very least. It, perhaps they're just deflecting, um, you know, and trying to kick the ball into someone else's court. It's boxing that should be looking at it. It's boxing that should be examining it and questioning who they're doing financial deals with, end of. The criminal end of it will be looked after by the policing authorities and, and is being. But the boxing end of it, that just seems to be this unregulated, lawless world from, from, from my eyes. But I, I don't know a huge amount about sport, but from where I'm sitting, it looks to be, it looks to be like the Wild West. Over the course of the past week, Nicola, since the airing of the Panorama documentary, there's been a fairly grim story about a journalist or a number of journalists involved in the production who have had threats made against them. Is this commonplace when covering this story, when covering Daniel Kinnan? Uh It's not commonplace, but there have been threats made to journalists, there's no doubt about it. Uh, they've been linked to the Kinahan Organised Crime Group, of which he is the head of. He stated yesterday that he seemed to be absolutely abhorred that it would be suggested that he would make threats against journalists, that he believes in journalism, um, the freedom of speech, all the rest of it. Uh, the fact of the matter is that he believes in the kind of journalism that allows him an uninterrupted, uh, you know, statement, the like of which he gave yesterday, that he's not questioned, he's not criticised, and, uh, you know, he's allowed to rewrite the course of history, which is what he did uh, in that statement yesterday. I mean, there's many parts of it that were pretty jaw-dropping. Obviously, the, the claims about journalists were one, and the other thing was really this whole 
picture he he created of this working class guy, him, who grew up in poverty in Dublin and really made good and and had worked so hard in boxing and it was his it was his passion and his prowess as a businessman that had got him to where he had got to. Um, there was no mention of the fact that um, you know his father his father created a, an Irish mafia on uh, drugs and guns and that he was uh, took over the running of it around 2014 and uh, the direction of it there was just a complete and utter just she rewrote history there you know that is that, it, it, go on, no. it, it, that rags to riches story is that something that really hits home quite a lot when it, it comes to boxing circles like is it working I guess basically outside of Ireland well, that's the first time I have to say I've heard that, but we haven't heard too much from Daniel Kinahan over the years anyway. He's just having a bit of a furore of publicity at the moment. That's the second statement by the way he's issued. You have to remember he issued a previous statement to the Irish Independent, which um, I don't believe had the effects he thought it was going to have. Um, I think he thinks when he speaks that everybody should just accept what he's saying um, and everyone should just see it the way he sees it. But, um, you know, we haven't, he, he hasn't been somebody that has, despite his, his uh, lofty heights in the boxing world, he hasn't been somebody that has spoken out before. So I, had, I hadn't realised he had that idea of himself, to be honest with you, as being impoverished. I mean, I don't think he would have had, uh, in, in his living memory, ever felt what poverty is. His father was uh, a major... Uh, drug trafficker by the time he was just a teenager. I mean, his father has convictions for heroin trafficking and was was probably, well, took over actually the, the heroin market after Larry Dunn was jailed. Larry Dunn being the original godfather of crime here in Ireland. And his father was in and out of jails throughout Europe uh, for money laundering and, and various other crimes um, while building essentially that Irish mafia in Spain. So Daniel Kinahan was you know, he did, he grew up in Tala and later in Oliver Bond, but he very quickly sort of used the family name to build up a mob around him. And by his early 20s, he's uh, featured in the UK in a, in a uh, horse racing fixing trial. He's named in that, um, where allegations were that the jockey Kieran Fallon was being strong armed to lose races. Um, and, you know, we follow him on in his 20s to Spain, where he lives in uh, mansions fit for millionaires and, and, like the rest of them, drives uh, different expensive cars every day. So I, I don't know where the poverty bit is coming from with him. Um, the community that he lived in, that he grew up in, is impoverished and more so because of the actions of him and, and, and his mob. Nicola, there's photographs in the paper of um, uh, the arrest in, in Spain. Where did that case go? How did that not end up reaching the conclusion that many people thought it would have reached? This was Operation Shovel in 2010. What happened there? Yeah, so what happened there was that was a massive big um, operation that, was, that involved UK, Irish police, Belgians. Um, there was investigation into money laundering, into weapons smuggling, into drug trafficking. The Kinahan gang were targeted. The Spanish system is extremely slow. There's many reasons, by the way, criminals live in Spain uh, en masse on the Costa del Sol and the justice system for those reasons. When police investigate, they hand over all their files to a magistrate who then investigates. That can go on for four years. Um, so they were all they were all put into custody. They the lawyers got them bail. Um, they got out and the investigation chugged along. Now, bit by bit, all of the charges were dropped until they ended up 10 years into it last year with a couple of sort of Mickey Mouse charges left on, on a few individuals. But the main things were dropped. Now, it's complex, but a number of reasons point to one is there is um, suspicion that the Kinahan organized crime group were paying two police officers on the Costa. I have no reason to disbelieve that. I have uh, 
there is evidence from previous uh, uh, investigations in Belgium that Christy Kinnan was paying police officers for information. Um, and, and in fact, that was before the courts there. That was one of the reasons. The second reason would be that the Spanish system just wasn't able for a big investigation like that. And thirdly, it's often been said there was a meeting held before the raids in, in May of 2010, and there was up to 300 officers briefed on what was going to happen from all the different territories that were involved. And I know here that the Irish Guardi were very, very wary when that happened because any raids on a criminal organization, especially a very rich one, most of the guards that are kicking in the doors don't even know whose door who's on the other side yeah. but you know on the morning of it so this is absolutely it is it is a no -no to brief that many people because yeah. it allows them time to um you know to move stuff and to shift stuff the suspicions that they left particular stuff to be found there was a lot of information uh found about brazilian property sites which tied the authorities up in knots for years because get documents from brazil and when they came to it, it was a bowl of smoke. There was there. They okay. thought they were going after all this land. But uh, Nicola, last question for you then. Um, what what do you think is what happens next? I mean, I, I know you say it's for boxing to sort out. Uh, like, we could be waiting a long time before boxing cares about anything other than making money. So, um, do you expect anything? Is there is there anything that you think will happen? Will this barrage of publicity continue? Is that now the kind of this is the the era that we're in? Well, I don't know what will happen next because he is behaving very un unpredictably, Daniel Kinahan. I mean, you wouldn't have necessarily thought that he was going to release that statement yesterday. I mean, if I was a PR person working for the mob, I probably would have told him to keep his head down after that panorama and to try and put out a few fires. I have no idea. Are sponsors pulling out? Are people moving away from him? Is he being seen as should be but you know it remains to be seen the boxing community seems to be very tight and it seems to be all focused on these two big fights billy joe saunders and, and Ken, uh, in may and then T uh, tyson fury and anthony joshua whenever that does happen there's an awful lot of money running up so they will just try and you know keep going to those uh, those ends nicola great to have you with us thanks a million for joining us this morning Thank you. It's Nicola Talent there, the Sunday World Investigations Editor and host of the Crime World podcast. I'm just going to read this. Daniel Kinahan, who's been identified in the High Court in Dublin as a senior figure in organised crime on a global scale, has said he is not part of a criminal gang in Ireland or anywhere in the world. He has never contested the findings of fact made against him in the Irish courts. Uh, it is 8.39 this morning here on OTBAM. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with uh, John Duggan. <laughs>